Well, good morning, everyone. I'd like to tell you a story uh, that starts in the summer of 2011. It was a hot and muggy morning. I got myself into a cab to JFK, got onto a flight to Salt Lake City, clear, crisp blue skies, and my family and I were just about to embark on an adventure there. I was just about to become the new CEO of the health system, the dean of the medical school, and the senior vice president of health sciences at the University of Utah. And at that time, there was a lot of national debate about the Affordable Care Act, uh, the constitutionality challenges that were moving through the courts. But for most of us, we were really attuned to the headlines that said, the train has left the station. The value train had left the station. Actually, the value train had only left some stations. And in Utah, we only really got a sense of it the following year when a couple of things happened. First, the Utah Medicaid office announced to us that as of January 1, 2013, all of the payments for Medicaid were going to become capitated, meaning we would get a fixed amount of money per member per month. And of course, if we overspent that to keep our patients healthy, that would be our loss. The second thing that happened was that CMS announced that they were looking for sites to participate in the bundled payment pilot project. And did we want to participate? Now, as a brand new CEO of a $3.5 billion health system, you might imagine that the thought of taking financial risk for all of our patients and their costs of care was terrifying to me, terrifying. And then when my team came in to try to explain the bundle payment pilot project, it just made it worse. <laughs> because they said, well, CMS is going to come in and look at our historical payments for, let's say, a total joint replacement. And then they're going to take 2% off of that. And that's going to be the new baseline. So I thought, oh, so appealing. And then they said, if we manage to reduce the cost of care even more, let's say $1,000 less for a total joint replacement, we get to share in those savings. Okay. The first thought that came to my mind when I heard that was, if we hit it lucky and we actually manage to reduce the cost of care, the first person to come into my door is going to be the chair of orthopedic surgery, saying, oh, thank you very much. That's my $1,000. Followed by the chair of anesthesiology, the chair of physical medicine and rehab, the head of the operating room, the step-down unit. You sort of get that picture. It sort of brought a whole new definition, a whole new meaning to that idea of two-sided risk. I sort of felt like we were damned if we did and damned if we didn't. So immediately as I reflected on that, I thought, well, three things have to happen for us to be able to survive, or for me personally, to be able to survive in this value-based, risk-based world. The first was that we're going to really have to figure out our cost of care, particularly for things like the bundles, total joint replacements, cabbages, and so on. The second was that we were going to have to really figure out if there were opportunities for us to reduce those costs of care. And then the third would be, to figure out how to attribute any cost savings or excesses to the right entities across the institution so that we could collectively be at risk, not just on my head. So that's what we set about to do. We set about trying to work out what the costs of care were for each episode, and together with that, also looking at the overall quality or outcomes measurements for each of those episodes of care, for each physician and each patient interaction. And we discovered that we weren't the only system in the country. It turned out to be that most of the nation really had no idea about the cost of care at that level. And when I say cost of care, I'm really referring to the cost of us running the business, not what we were billing or charging, but what it really cost us to run the hospital. And once we started looking at those costs, it was really phenomenal. The impact was amazing. I, as a radiologist, I had no idea how much it cost us to, say, keep an MRI, keep a patient in the MRI scanner for an extra five minutes, or for a surgeon to stay in the operating room an extra 10 or 15 minutes, much less what the cost of, say, that hip implant was, or the cost of anticoagulation therapy, for example. We really had no idea. And once we started looking at the data, the impact was transformative, because uh, you may know, many of you may be physicians yourselves, that physicians are quite a curious lot. We were curious about the information. And then we're also a rather competitive group of people. Those of you who aren't physicians may remember us back in the college days as those pre-meds. That was us. 
So once we started putting out that data, though, it turns out what really drove our physicians on the competition side was less the cost and more really about the quality, because most of us really wanted to be thought of as delivering the best outcomes for our patients. And as we started to look at both the measurement of cost and quality, it turns out that our physicians were not particularly satisfied with the quality measures that were being defined by our payers. And so they asked us, could we offer a few of our own perspectives on how to measure quality and how to define value? And we accepted that. In fact, we welcomed that, as long as the parameters were evidence-based and justified by the literature. And that really gave us a lot more buy-in in this journey to value because we agreed that we needed to listen not only to the payers' voices, but also to the physicians and clinicians and frontline voices. As the organization started to move forward, we did see tremendous buy-in. We saw a um, continued increase in our quality metrics. We saw cost reductions. Many of those actually did contribute to our bottom line, so we saw an increase in our operating margin, almost twofold. We also saw increased employee engagement and a much lower rate of physician burnout than nationally. That said, as our organization started to think a lot more about value and who should be defining value, something became so obvious to all of us which is that we were really missing the most important voice in the discussion about value, which was the patient's voice. Now, at the University of Utah, we had done a lot of work in patient satisfaction. And in fact, we had really prided ourselves on being among the first to really engage patients with surveys. And we were the first in the country in 2012 to post our patient satisfaction scores online with the familiar yellow stars. So we did that in December of 2012 and included all the patient comments. So it was sort of a natural next step to move from patient satisfaction questions to really asking patients about their actual outcomes. About maybe four or five years ago, we started collecting patient-reported outcomes, asking patients either on their phone, on their tablets, on their desktops, or in the waiting room of our clinics to answer questions about their physical function, about their psychological well-being, including screening for depression, and also their social well-being, how engaged they were in their communities, whether they felt isolated or lonely. And that information has really fed into our overall measurement of quality and our overall measurement of value that we're delivering in the healthcare system. Now, my thinking about the value question has really evolved even more because I thought to myself, well, this is a really great step. It's great to ask patients how they're actually doing when they come and see us in the clinics or when they come see us or when they're discharged, let's say, from the hospital. But wouldn't it be even better? Wouldn't it be even better, first of all, if we just avoided hospitalizations altogether? Wouldn't it be even better if we not only asked them how they were feeling, but if we had a little bit more data and insights in terms of their own biology and their own physiology? And wouldn't it be even better if we got data not just when they were in the clinics or in the hospital, but the 99.99% of their lives when they're not in our healthcare system, when they're at home, when they're with their families, when they're at work? And wouldn't it be even better if health wasn't just about the delivery of care that we provided as a system, but if it were really about the co-production of health, the co-production between our patients and our delivery systems to produce health. And I've had the opportunity to think a lot more about that recently, about uh, after a year sabbatical when I've been working on a book on healthcare reform, um, stay tuned. Um, I joined five months ago a company called Verily, and I feel very privileged to have done that. It's in the technology sector, as you heard. It is part of the Alphabet family. It is the healthcare and life sciences part of the Google family of businesses. And there I've really come to appreciate what can happen when you can bring together technology with our healthcare delivery system to really think about what matters to patients. And probably the best way to explain that is to tell the story of Stephen from Marietta, Georgia. Stephen's been very open about his health and his health care. You can read about him actually online. Um, Stephen had been experiencing, um, he, he had been categorized as being pre-diabetic for years. And then about a year ago, he started feeling really bad one day with some nausea and vomiting and some dizziness. He went to the emergency room. 
His blood sugar was 440, and he was diagnosed with type 2 diabetes. And for the ensuing months, you know, he tried pricking his finger all the time. He was very good. He was really trying, um, took his medications, and he still just didn't feel like he could keep his blood glucoses under control. So on the advice of his physician, he enrolled in a program that was sponsored by his insurer, Blue Cross Blue Shield of Georgia. And that program was a virtual diabetes clinic offered by Onduo, which is a joint venture between Sanofi and Verily, the company that I work for. So when he participated in that, the first thing that he got was this device, um, the pink device here to the right. It's a continuous glucose monitor. It's a little smaller than a quarter. And within it is this chip that has a blood glucose sensor as well as the world's smallest uh, Bluetooth transmitter. And he puts this device on his abdomen and it has a small wire that goes just under the skin and measures his blood glucose or estimates his blood glu glucose continuously and then transmits it to the app. So no more finger sticks for him. He has 24-7 insights into his blood glucose. And then on the app, which was developed by Onduo, the device was developed by Dexcom with Verily. But on this app, a few things happen. So first of all, you know that the most important factor to your managing your diabetes is really what you eat. And so what Stephen does is he takes pictures of his meals and of his snacks. And using some Google machine learning computer vision magic, it's magic to me, <laughs> it recognizes his meals and it actually estimates the nutritional value of that. And as he's looking at his meals, he can also track there right below that his blood glucose. The blue bar, the light blue bar, is where we're hoping his sugars will remain. And so he can see that that muffin type thing probably wasn't the best. You could see his sugar sort of spiked after that. He can also track his exercise um, on the same app. And he can share all this information with a coach, with a health coach who's available to him 24-7. And that coach can offer some useful insights that he himself might not make. So for example, after he had done this for a few weeks, they realized together that it was high fructose corn syrup that somehow was a real trigger for Stephen. And as long as he avoided that, he was really able to manage his blood sugars. And so for Stephen, this kind of, this story I think brings together what happens when you have the technology with the sensors, you have an app that has some engagement and really can kind of help you get insights into your own body in a way that you've never had before, together with some healthcare expertise to figure out on the patient's terms what matters and how to kind of get him to where he would like to be. Now, with diabetes, we know about blood sugar. We understand more or less the physiology, although we've actually, as you can imagine, gained a lot of new insights that we never imagined before with this, with the, the thousands of patients that are in it. Um, but there are many other diseases that we don't have such a good sensor and such a good marker. So I just want to leave you with a little bit of a teaser of what might be possible and tell you about this project that was started, or was maybe formulated about a decade ago by Rob Califf, who many of you may know is a leading cardiologist and clinical trialist and former FDA commissioner, together with Andy Conrad, who's the CEO of Verily. And they recruited a woman, Dr. Jess Mega, from the Brigham of Women's to run this project called Project Baseline. And their hypothesis was that most of us in healthcare were trying to figure out how people transition from health to disease. And for the most part, the information that we really need to predict that transition is probably not being collected by us in the traditional healthcare system now. Because it's probably more to do with the food we eat, the exercise, the environment, the air we breathe, how well we sleep, obviously to do with our omics, our genomics, our proteomics, and even with our microbiome, all the bacteria that kind of cohabit our bodies. So they set out to collect all of that information. It's about six terabytes per patient, thousands of individuals over many years, in order for us to gain that insights, gain that insight, and be able to figure out what are the sensors that we need to develop, what are the apps and technologies we need to help so that we can understand ourselves and control our own fates and, and maintain that health. So for me, this is the ultimate journey in value 
It's really all about how do we create the very, very best outcomes and define that value in terms of the patient and what matters to us. And then, of course, prevention is the lowest possible cost. So the journey to value, in my mind, is really only just beginning. Thank you very much.